This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Professor Kung is the author or co-author of several dozen books, uh, many of which have been translated into several European and non-European languages. Among his uh, leading publications are Does God Exist? Uh, Why I Am Still a Christian? Christianity and World Religions? Global Responsibility in Search of a New World Ethic, which inspired the declaration toward a global ethic that was endorsed by the World uh, Parliament of Religions in 1993. Professor Kung uh, has also published substantive works on Judaism and Islam in recent years. And in addition to uh, an English translation of his second volume of memoirs published this last summer, his most recent book is on science and religion. And it's entitled, The Beginning of All Things. Our second panelist, Mark Juergensmeyer, is director of the Ofella Center uh, for Global and International Studies and a member of the UCSB Sociology Department. He's published about 20 books, including A New Cold War on Religious Nationalism, Terror in the Mind of God, The Global Rise of Religious Violence, uh, which was fortuitously published in a revised edition just before 9-11. And as a consequence of that, he has been appeared on many uh, of the national and international media as an expert on the terrorism phenomena. Uh, most recently, he's published Global Religion, uh, Religious Challenges to the Secular State, his Stafford Little lecture, Lectures that he delivered at Princeton University will be published as a book under the title God at War. He's also edited two recent volumes on global religions and civil society. Our third panelist, Professor Wade Clark Roof, is the director of the Walter Capps Center for the Study of Ethics uh, and um, is a faculty member of the Religious Studies Department at UCSB. He is the author or editor of 14 books, including Spiritual Marketplace, Baby Boomers and the Remaking of American Religion, Contemporary American Religion, and Bridging uh, Divided Worlds. In 2007, he edited an issue of the Annals on the subject of religious pluralism and civil society. Most recently, he has received a sizable grant from the Ford Foundation uh, to study the 2008 presidential election and the prospects for progressive religion in the United States. And this project will be involved in looking at the rhetoric uh, used in the recent presidential elections as it relates to religious and political vision. And it will also uh, involve sponsoring of lectures on progressive social issues as they relate to various traditions in the, in the United States, the Catholic, mainline Protestant, uh, moderate evangelical Protestant, Jewish, Muslim, and African American. 24 congregations in Southern California across these different traditions will engage in reflection on progressive priorities and alliances with others in seeking to bring about positive change. Professors uh, Jurgens Meyer and Roof also jointly are co-editors for a forthcoming four-volume encyclopedia entitled Encyclopedia of Global Religion and Society. So I think you can get an idea here of the fact that our theme of globalization, religion, and the public sphere is very much to the fore among the three panelists that we have this afternoon. So I'd like to uh, begin by inviting uh, Professor Hans Kung to make his opening remarks with respect to the subject, why it's important, the relations between these things, globalization, religion, and the public sphere, and, uh, and what are some of the key issues that are involved in these interrelationships. Professor Kung? Thank you very much. Now, uh, my main thesis is that the current financial crisis clearly demonstrates that the free market economy is not without its cost. The world is facing a failure of markets, a failure of institutions, and that is most important, a failure of ethics. It only one of the three elements, economics, politics, and morality, does not work. It can cause serious troubles for the market economy worldwide. Ethics 
is therefore not just the icing on the cake. It is not marginal or an artificial addition to the features that shape the global market economy. We can justifiably talk of a moral framework which should sustain a new financial architecture. Ethics denotes not only appeals, but moral action. Without a set of elementary ethical standards, it will not be possible to tame fatal human greed. Obviously, strain was needed in the financial markets in order to create pressure to reform, which can turn into political agenda. And there is hope that President Barack Obama addresses this issue. Now, a third step, uh, to, and then I shall have finished, just uh, to say it more ex extemporaneously, and this will probably lead to the questions you have. Uh, now, in the political realm, what is probably more our topic, but I wanted to touch econ economy first. I see uh, the, the problem uh, that we have practically two extreme positions in the world, especially in Europe, but uh, you have it here in the sense in a different way, uh, which I think are not uh, good positions and which we have uh, to find again here uh, a middle way. In this way, I am Aristotelian to find the middle way between two vices. Um, the first is what I would call the model of French laïcité. Uh, French laïcité, I made my doctorate in Paris and I have a great, a great uh, admiration of France and fr French culture, but I think they, uh, they did not digest very well um, um, the results, the positive results of the French Revolution and they are still, in a way, this kind of French laicists, there are others, who won't practically uh, ignore religion at all. So you have then the fact that uh, a whole generation of youngsters uh, is, uh, you say, educated or educated, educated without any knowledge of, uh, of ethics and religion. And you have not to be surprised that they have so many problems in the banlieue de Paris and elsewhere. I do not want to go into the detail. I don't think that a purely secular, secularist, secularist uh, uh, solution of uh, model is a solution for our time. That's one extreme. Of course, you have another extreme, and as a matter of fact, the, the, the other extreme helps the French laicists to come up again. And that is, I am sorry to say that, is uh, Roman Catholic uh, 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 model of uh, Karol Wojtyla, uh, John Paul II. He already made a speech, I know uh, that you are all admirer of his uh, holiness, I am, um, uh, I am more his victim, uh, but, uh, but uh, that is a past period. But uh, what is not past, and I do not want to polemicize, is that in the Vatican still they have this idea, and I think my former good colleague in Tübingen during two, uh, three years, and uh, which I had again a nice conversation of four hours in Gastrogadolfo, now Pope Benedict, uh, he dreams still a little in this way that you can have a restoration of the Christian order, at least in Europe, and if possible, also in America. As a matter of fact, John Paul II gave a speech already in 1982, and you make uh, a big work on pilgrimage. So uh, it was in Compostela, Santiago de Compostela, where he made a big speech about the unity of Europe that is, of course, considered a Christian unity. And so he proclaimed the program of a re-Christianization. Well, nothing against the Christian renewal of Christianity. I, I, I worked a great deal for that, and I've written a rather small book on being a Christian. <laughs> but, uh, you know, in this context, re-Christianization means practically uh, re-Catholicization and uh, practically, uh, well, a reactionary movement of restoration. Uh, and that includes then that in order to be a Christian, you have to agree with the present Roman policy against uh, anti-conception, uh, against the ordination of women. Uh, you have to be for the possible, uh, well, for all sorts of things. 
And of course, this was even for European politicians, even of the Christian Democratic Party, too much. We had a big conflict about uh, uh, that, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, Joseph Ratzinger, as president of the, uh, uh, of, uh, of the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, asked that for, uh, you know, these women in pregnancy, uh, uh, they had a, a compromise solution. Uh, it was a tremendous battle between the, uh, also between the German bishops and uh, Colonel Ratzinger and the Roman position. I think, uh, to make it short, that this is again also, I think, the wrong solution. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, this model proved to be absolutely inefficient. I think uh, we have not to be uh, impressed too much just by, uh, by uh, positive uh, uh, success in the media, that's a different thing. But you have absolutely no change in the position of Catholics all over the world in these questions. Uh, he did not achieve anything. As a matter of fact, Wojtyla's uh, dream as a Polish uh, Catholic was that everything should be as he thought it, would, uh, it is in Poland, you know, a Polish Catholic model, which is, as a matter of fact, according to the paradigm changes we uh, treated yesterday, the medieval paradigm, which is anti-reformation uh, and, uh, and is anti-modern, um, anti-modernity. Now, this uh, proved to be no success, and I think the tragic situation of John Paul II was that he had to realize, and he realized it rather early, that the opposite happened. The, the Polish Catholic model uh, he had in mind was not imposed on Europe, and uh, uh, not, uh, also not the Germans were impressed, the French anyway were not impressed by it, but as a matter of fact, the opposite happened. Poland was impressed by modernization, and he made a tremendous speech against the Polish parliament about the boss, or I do not remember, you have, you say, we have not to vote, they voted against him. So uh, that's only an indication uh, this is a failure. And of course, Protestants f uh, feel, uh, felt uh, alienated. And I think the uh, recent uh, uh, do uh, document of the Congregation of the Doctrine for Faith, which uh, again denies against the intention of the Second Vatican Council that the Protestant churches are real churches, is on this line. And I think uh, all this is counterproductive. And, uh, uh, will, of course, not be accepted. Protestants are alienated, the Jews are alienated. I talked to Jews in Poland, you know. Uh, there was not a very happy uh, comment on the situation of Jews in Poland. And uh, I think, especially, of course, now, uh, the, the, French, uh, the French secularists were offended. And we had a big uh, debate in the European Parliament whether you are uh, allowed to use the word of God in the preamble, uh, that of course can be disputed in a, in a secular state. Uh, but it was not even allowed to mention the Christian tradition as one of the sources of Europe, what is absurd, I, I think, historically speaking. Uh, so you see, here you have two extreme positions which are then helping each other. Uh, les French, the French say, les extrêmes se touchent. And they, you know, I think at the time of John XXIII, who was the greatest pope of the 20th century, according to my vision, we would not have, this kind of, have had this kind of discussion. Now we have it again, because restoration, of course, ha ha is then a revival of this French, you know, uh, 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 laicity. So, um, conclusion, I would think what we need is a model which is between the two, and this is precisely the secular states as we have it, which cannot be just taken by one religion, neither Catholic nor, nor uh, also not Muslim. That's a special problem we can discuss maybe afterwards. Uh, they are on the way to this kind of things uh, to see the problems. Uh, but a secular state who need, which needs an ethical foundation, I think, 
Uh, this has not to be an ethical system, I spoke about it yesterday, but certain ethical standards, modern democracy are just a presupposed. We, they cannot be imposed, but they have to be presupposed. If you do not have, if, if um, and I had a discussion with Henry Kissinger about that, if the state has an other kind of morality, as he pre presented a big volume on diplomacy, uh, as the individual uh, citizen, then of course the statesman can do everything he wants, and he has done everything he wants to have, you know, without uh, being much concerned about ethics. As a matter of fact, he only speaks in his book about moral feelings, and you know, uh, he does not mention even uh, people who had a great influence in, uh, in, in world politics uh, from the richer side. I think uh, we, we have to acknowledge. And the most recent scandals we had in the White House lying um, in Wall Street, in stealing, uh, in the media, in Germany, even in my home country, Switzerland, we had all these problems with the banks and so on. Well, I think now we are in a transition phase, but not only of the American presidency, but also I think in the world. I think we, it's just obvious that the old system is collapsing and uh, I, I have uh, was among those who predicted it uh, and warned uh, against it, but I hope we, it's, a, it's a little smoothly. But I am sure that after that, we, we will have a revival of, of ethics. Uh, already now we say, well, also these people are not allowed uh, to, to steal, you know, billions of dollars, uh, just fa falsifying balance, uh, balance sheets in, 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 in big uh, corporations, or also the President of the United States is not allowed to lie. Uh, and, uh, or, well, the same problems you have in Japan, in uh, Germany, uh, everywhere. Uh, so let us be uh, now uh, for a secular state. But uh, also at the same time, we need a moral framework for modern society, which, uh, uh, con uh, which uh, is just a few rules not to kill innocent people, not uh, to steal and to, uh, uh, to for, for the, everything I mentioned yesterday. I'm grateful that you gave me so much time. And I shall end with that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn. Professor Jurgensmeyer. Well, Professor uh, Kung, thank you so much for the kind of insightful, thought-provoking, and precise thinking that's exhibited so uh, magnificently in your writings and in your public comments today. It uh, truly is a pleasure to be in your company. And to reflect with you about global ethics for a time of globalization. Because it's the global part of global ethics that in some ways intrigues me most. Not only the idea of global as universal, uh, which itself is an interesting notion. To what extent does co do concepts of ethics transcend their cultural limitations? And are, to what extent are they embodied deep within the human psyche or perhaps in the social biology of humans as creatures? And to what extent are they are we able to fabricate across cultural lines a consensus on, on ethical norms that are important and uh, binding to all people? And that sense of globalization, of course, is intriguing, but even more so for me, it's the idea of an ethics for an era of globalization. An, ethics. an era of globalization, a time of globalization right. in which politics, economics, culture, uh, these three important dimensions of uh, human existence are increasingly taking place on transnational planes. And where things that affect us deeply often are beyond the limitations of any particular nation state to control them, but also beyond the kind of reaches of any particular cultural tradition. So it's in this period, it seems to me, that religion offers a great deal of hope but it also offers a great deal of despair. Uh, because it's precisely at this moment that rather strident religious voices have found in religious ideologies, religious language, religious symbols, sometimes religious leadership, the articulation of resentment 
against the forces of globalization, particularly when it appears clothed in a very secular main. Because it seems to me that the rise of radical religion of the last 15, 20 years that so perplexes many of us and confounds American foreign policy uh, is not simply a, a religious matter. Because after all, these are not religious groups that are trying to force their beliefs on other people, but rather almost uniformly, at least in the interviews that I've engaged in, the reading that I've done, almost uniformly are thought of by the proponents of these movements as defensive of trying to protect their cultural integrity in a world that they see that is trying to unravel what is distinctive about human identity, human culture, and human dignity. Now this is an extraordinary thing because it seems to me that the critique of religious activism of the contemporary period really hits at something that is experienced almost universally among all of us. And that is the kind of mind-numbing um, lack of identity, a lack of human consciousness of contemporary global culture. Uh, to go from one franchise outlet to the other, to move from one part of the world with the same ubiquitous cultural symbols, uh, to move in an area where the same distributive networks of, uh, mer of merchandise and services seem to have captured the whole of the planet are all symptoms to us of the kind of McDonaldization of the world uh, and, and also the McDonaldization of the human potential where we feel like we are simply consumer objects. We feel like we are simply units in vast and enormous uh, global uh, cogs. And all of us feel that. But even more dramatically, those people who have articulated a very sharp uh, extremist religious response that is political, economic, and cultural. It's political in that it sees the globalization of politics as a way that oppresses them. This is certainly a driving force in the Middle East. And so many uh, people who have taken a, a, a radical jihadi position, uh, seeing their own cultures controlled politically by uh, the he hegemon of American power. Economically, surely, uh, it, it impacts especially people who feel somehow left out of the beneficial aspects of globalization, meant to be simply um, workers in factories and consumer pawns in a vast global economic network. And it certainly impacts globally on people who feel that <clears throat> the internet, the videos, movie all project a kind of wondrous world of Southern California to the rest of the world, a kind of Baywatch idealism uh, that they never can aspire to, can never achieve, and in most cases never really want. Uh, so we live uh, in a world that, that whether we like it or not, uh, it's these uh, tentacles of globalization that so permeate the rest of the world for which uh, often strident religious voices are an angry response. And they're strident indeed, sometimes tinged with violence, sometimes tinged with hatred, often intolerant, uh, often derisive of what the UN regards as the secular framework of human rights, because rights, after all, don't include obligations. Rights are highly individually individual, do not encompass collectivities. And so this radical critique, it seems to me, in, in some ways, is a, a great opponent of global ethics. But at the same time, there is this religious strand with the human condition. And there's this religious dimension of culture that embraces tolerance and openness to all people that, that argues for the dignity of all life, that argues for the variety and diversity of the human condition in ways that uh, are embrace tolerance and that speak very highly for the possibility of a global ethic. In global studies, it's very popular to talk about um, cosmopolitanism, this new cosmopolitan world where we were all citizens of one culture on the planet. 
And surely this cosmopolitan culture of global civil society has a moral and spiritual dimension to which uh, religious um, traditions can be powerful contributors. I'm pleased to say that the Orpheus Center, of which I'm a part, has been working on issues of religion and global civil society, and we've just received notice this last week that the Henry Luce Foundation has awarded us with a sizable $400,000 grant over the next three years to work on these issues, to have conferences, to have publications, to try to, to work into the curriculum of international affairs a sensitivity to the role of religion uh, in global civil society. But that's the paradox. Is religion the problem uh, or is religion the solution? Is religion a harm uh, to uh, global uh, ethics or is it, does it provide a healing touch? Thank you very much, Professor Dickinson. Professor Clark Proof. Thank you. My appreciation to Hans Kung, not just for his being here in your lecture last evening, but for your lifelong contributions and reflections on theology and ethics. Thank you so much. My comments today focus uh, sociologically on the possibility and promise of a global ethic. I begin with the assumption that whether religion in the global context does or does not contribute to civility is an open question. It can do either. Negative consequences for civility, especially when religion is called upon to legitimate global tensions and conflicts, are all too apparent to all of us. Less visible are the positive consequences, and no doubt they call for more deliberative effort. To assess these possibilities, I think we have to look first at the nature of global interdependence and the role that religion occupies in this structure, and then second, the implications of and necessity for new social forms of religion. Global interdependence is largely economic and political in character. Those are the ties that hold it together and change its form. Which means that religion, by and large, occupies a secondary role in that structure. Secondary is not unimportant, especially when religious myths, symbols, and beliefs are drawn upon to sacralize nation states and ideologies. But to say religion occupies a secondary role does mean that its power, its autonomous power for social change, is somewhat impaired relative to the dominant political and economic forces. This is further complicated, of course, by the fragmentation of religious traditions in modernity and the competing interpretations brought on by the onslaught of all the modern political and economic forces. Yet not to be overlooked is that in contemporary democracies, there is a discernible escalation in what has come to be called social movement religion. I speak not so much about religious movements as we typically think of these, as about the thousands of movements, some more visibly organized than others, devoted to mobilizing people, ideas, and material resources around particular causes, and devoted to bringing about change in existing social structures, if not generating new structures. The global environmental movement is one such example. What is important about social movement religion is that in the age of the internet, it is global in character. It bonds constituencies across boundaries of nation states and across religious traditions. Attention to global ethics and to interfaith dialogue and cooperation are themselves increasingly being addressed, if we can measure that on the basis of websites now devoted to those causes as compared to 10 years ago. Critically important, too, is that an increased number of these broadly based populist movements, especially here in the United States since 9-11, are devoted to cultivating a public awareness 
about social ethics and shifting away from the more personal therapeutic culture that has described our situation since the 1960s. This is in keeping with Jose Casanova's thesis of some years back about a growing deprivatization in the religions around the world, or that is, a growing public face for religion within the contemporary world. This fact, greater public awareness and concern over social ethical issues, apparent across religious traditions, including even among younger evangelical Christians, as based upon the recent election, combined with the Obama election and the excitement that it has generated around the world, lead me to wonder, at least to wonder, if indeed we may be entering into a period of progressive religious ferment. George Lakoff, the cognitive theorist at Berkeley, calls attention to the significance of the deep frames of human imageries, symbols, and narratives. Noting that the Bush era, the George W. Bush era, has been characterized by an authoritarian God image imposing, as he says, a father ideology on America and ultimately the rest of the world. Perhaps, just perhaps, we're now moving into a time of a more nurturing, warmer, and embracive imagery, one arousing, arising out of the people's own experiences and quest for common bonds amidst all of our global diversity. If so, the relations between religion, globalization, and the public sphere, which is our topic for this panel, may be changing somewhat. Robert Wethnow's recent research shows that religious communities across, in all traditions, in this country and in other countries, are increasingly engaged in global agendas be it in partnerships with other communities in other countries or involvement in interfaith dialogue and ethics in the new sense of interfaith, that is involving Muslims and Buddhists and not just Protestants, Catholics, and Jews. Muslims and Jews are reportedly talking to one another more now than five years ago. You may have noticed in the New York Times last week there was this huge one-page announcement about the twinning of uh, Muslim and Jewish congregations for discussion, 50 pairs across the United States, and calling for 100 more pairs. There seems to be a movement underway in that respect. Also, the Abrahamic Faith Initiative is gaining momentum with a changing focus, not so much to get to know one another as to discuss their common dilemmas anti-Semitism and Islamophobia and the similarities in which that bring them together. Now whether all of this translates to a global ethic in the sense that Hans Kuhn speaks, I don't know. But it would appear to be a step in some direction toward that goal. Briefly a couple concluding comments. Whatever happens in the time period that we're now, or in this new era of, of globalization as we understand it today, I think technology will be critical to that conversation and to that possible action. The Obama campaign showed us that the internet is effective in mobilizing people for political action. It is more than simply a medium for conversation. The internet now joins mass mailings and political action committees as a tool to bring about social and political change. Its possibilities for ethical movements remain to be fully tapped. Institutionally, I think we have to think about how we devise new forms. First, we need mediating institutions. There are many examples of mediating institutions, but one very important in the global context is the one that was developed close by in Los Angeles, the Code of Ethics established in 1999 between the Muslim and Jewish communities. This agreement fosters dialogue on many issues, but more than just dialogue, one aspect that this institution was able to create 
was an agreement between the two communities, the Muslim and the Jewish communities, that whenever there was an outbreak of conflict in the Middle East, and in particular between the Israelis and the Palestinians, that before either of these communities in Los Angeles, Angel Los Angeles would issue a statement, they would seek to study and dialogue about what had happened and issue a joint statement. Now, this covenant has not always withstood the pressures uh, of, of, of the groups offering their own statements, but in more instances than not, joint statements have been issued when there have been critical uh, conditions elsewhere in the world, and particularly in the Middle East. As mediating structures, such structures illustrate the point that global populations are interconnected, that actions in one place can have repercussions elsewhere, and that local responses anywhere must be carefully considered and people's perceptions and fears not become the basis on which responses follow. It illustrates something further very fundamental as well. For religion to have an effective presence in adjudicating global disputes, it must accept the basic institutional terms of modernity, that is, submit to rational analysis and respond not simply on the basis of emotion. Second and finally, we need stronger implementing institutions. In democratic societies, religion is a matter of voluntary choice. Commitment arises from the people, bottom up, not top-down. It must be galvanized and mobilized into action. Implementation of this sort is more likely if religious constituencies work together, create alliances and partnerships, strategize in relation to political realities, also work with non-religious groups on behalf of common values. Maybe what is needed is for religious groups to strip themselves of much of their historic religious rhetoric and substitute in its place the cries of humanity for a better and safer world. Thank you. Now we invite our panelists to um, respond to each of the presentations. Professor Kung, would you like to begin with some observations and remarks? Yes, with great pleasure because uh, I think we heard very rich contributions and I must just uh, uh, um, confess that I need a certain time to digest all what you said uh, because you mentioned very many interesting aspects and I think uh, um, I, I found everything most stimulating and uh, what is even more important I find nothing to what I would have to have checked <laughs> uh, because uh, I think we have um, common lines and common questions. Um, first, uh, just to, to uh, say a word about Mark Jürgens Meyer's uh, position, I think we probably agree that religion is at the same time, as you say, a part of the problem and a part of the solution. And that has to do with the fact that uh, we, uh, uh, religion is a human phenomenon and everything what is a human phenomenon has two sides. Even music has two sides. You can abuse music as you can abuse a religion and it has often been abused. In Europe we sent hundreds of thousands, millions of people with music in the war from all sides with the Marseillaise, with Deutschland, Deutschland, Liberales, you know, music. <clears throat> and uh, so it's no argument against religion that it can be abused. I always say, I think all of us who have a great experience of religion know more about it th than those who have no experience of religion. Uh, it is important at the same time to see that there are, of course, positive contribution, and this was visible in your position, um, uh, which is most important, as a matter of fact, even in world politics, 
um, it is uh, all too often ignored that uh, religions had a very effective um, function to fulfill um, in mediating and peacemaking. As a matter of fact, one of our fellows at our foundation wrote a book, Religion macht Frieden. That's an ambivalent uh, formulation. Religion makes, uh, reli uh, reli uh, religion macht Frieden, yes. Religion makes freedom, uh, uh, peace, or religion might and peace. But he has 40, more or less 40 examples in all over the world where we have very clear affirmations uh, uh, where religions were involved. I would just mention uh, one example, uh, which was for me most um, uh, revelatory and the analysis among 14, 40 others. For me, person was the abolition of apartheid. I think um, a major uh, experience. I was down there giving lectures in all the big cities. And I remember that an ambassador, after my talk in, uh, in Cape Town, told me, you are an optimist, uh, and you will fail. You will see, it, they will never abolish a part. Uh, this was in the time of W. Uh, Bota, uh, at the end of the apartheid period. They will never abolish uh, apartheid without the bloodshed. And they can even use the atomic bomb to, uh, if necessary. I said, well, maybe you are right, but I don't think so. And he was not right. Why? Well, because we had an internet uh, of uh, people, uh, I think probably a good friend of you too, I think uh, who will, uh, the person who will give the next uh, global ethics lecture in Tübingen is uh, Desmond Tutu, the Archbishop, De Desmond Tutu. Uh, Dr. Bias Nodé of, uh, uh, was uh, the, the president of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, National Council of Churches. Uh, my friend from, uh, who was with me at the council, the Archbishop of Durban, Hurley, and other, a whole network, and they were able to have a, a, this transformation of an apartheid so society into a civil society with uh, great uh, certainly deficiencies, nevertheless, without the bloodshed, and they introduced, for instance, the Truth Commission. Uh, you know, that was also a very original religious initiative. So I think it would be good to have this book translated also into into English, uh, because uh, diplomats they don't know about all these things. Politicians, I mean, statesmen. I often to do with statesmen, they do not know these things. Uh, so I agree perfectly that. Uh, uh, what we know anyway, that is a, a little boring for me, you know, I have a soul, I know all the vices of the Catholic Church better than anybody else. I, uh, I studied it and I suffered them on, uh, under them. So uh, it's not very, uh, what is interesting and simulating are the positive aspects you, you were mentioning. Uh, and I think uh, uh, here I, I, I come to Clark Roof's remarks, which uh, I, I also, uh, uh, agreed uh, with, with everything. I think uh, uh, I would just like to, to, to reflect a little. I had no time. All your very interesting suggestions. Uh, as a matter of fact, about the internet. Uh, well, um, uh, what uh, I think it just came to my mind that, of course, the internet and these religious social movements. Uh, uh, they are, to a certain extent, of course, um, um, and as a matter of fact, all these NGOs, well, a certain balance against the multinational corporations, a very powerful element. You know, uh, so, uh, we, are, we are often complaining about uh, the negative impacts of Shell and the oil companies in Nigeria and elsewhere. Well, they were able, for instance, just by and this uh, possibility will increase by the internet to, uh, to uh, activate a worldwide opposition to oil drilling down there in Nigeria. And uh, Shell had uh, to correct its policy, uh, especially the social consequences. So I think all this is basically positive. 
Uh, of course, all of these religious movements, I think we agree, both agree on that, are very often ambivalent. Even my friends of the liberation theology of Latin America, uh, um, uh, uh, I uh, am a great friend and admirer of uh, Gustavo Gutierrez, I must say, and, uh, um, and also of Leonardo Boff, and I know most of them. As a matter of fact, I, I was in, uh, in, uh, in uh, uh, San Salvador, exactly the residence where they were killed, the Jesuits, you know, which is now again uh, in, 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 on the judiciary. Um, so I, uh, but I warned them always about two things. First, about uh, the problems um, of uh, the, the church structures. They said, my problems I have with papal infallibility are past. That, that's, these are not anymore their problems. They are looking for the world and so on. I said, well, 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 well. you will see, pazienza. As soon as you touch uh, the power structures of the Roman Catholic Church, you will get into troubles as I did. And it is exactly what happened, unfortunately. And they were much more under pressure and not so able to defend themselves as I was able because of my juridical position at the state university, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Second, I, I always warned them uh, not against a Marxist analysis. I think Marxist analysis is quite good. And as a matter of fact, now a lot of people in Europe buy again Karl Marx's uh, capital, mm -hmm. das Kapital, because, well, they think he was nevertheless quite correct on the collapse of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the capitalist system. But of course, uh, cap uh, uh, Marxist uh, uh, solutions are, are mostly bad. They're mostly inefficient. And I think we have all the experience of the Soviet Union. We have uh, all the experience of Eastern Germany. And I never, uh, and I was always an admirer of Solzhenitsyn, uh, you know, and uh, this was my line. I have nothing to correct in my book on being a Christian where I treated uh, this in the, uh, the horizon. So uh, I criticized already then liberation theology and that is only uh, one aspect of these movements. Uh, they are sometimes very uh, ideologized, as a, uh, especially if they are one issue people. Uh, they only see peace, 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 uh, or they only see women, 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 uh, and uh, they only see nature, nature, nature. You have all sorts of people, you know, if a cat is in difficulties, uh, uh, that's a bigger problem than uh, if a whole uh, house burns down for many people, like here in the fire. They are concerned with animals. Well, I do not want to polemicize. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I only speak against this, uh, this Uni, unilateralism, you can call it in an ideological way, just to have to see only one thing and nothing else. And the religiously motivated people very often uh, have a great deal of idealism, but uh, not often not a great range of knowledge, I must say. The information is often very minimal. And about capitalism, they know more or less nothing. Uh, well, even capitalism, uh, is, uh, I think, an ambivalent phenomenon. As a matter of fact, I must say quite clearly, even here uh, in California, I, uh, um, I, and I think I'm not alone in that, as a matter of fact, it's the classical the, uh, social doctrine of the Catholic Church, that we are between capitalism and socialism. And socialism is for me, if you want, a dirty word, but capitalism is a dirty word, both. And we are, as I said, for a market economy, but a social, and today we would say an eco-social market economy, a market economy which has obligations, not as my colleague at the University of Chicago when I was up there as guest, uh, as a visiting professor this semester in 81, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, you know, who thinks uh, that uh, uh, the only uh, moral obligation uh, uh, of business is uh, to, to make profits. I think what we have now, the present catastrophe, 
in the American and world economy and in Europe, we imitated all these kind of things. I protested always. Being a friend of America, I was against this kind of America, Americanization, you know, what you can, McDonaldization or whatever you call it. Uh, um, uh, so that we were imitating in the banking system everything. I uh, dedicate, as a matter of fact, it's, a, it's also a quite curious thing. Let me just see. Uh, I, I dedicate this to the, uh, uh, to the founders of the Global Ethics Foundation, but I dedicated uh, um, the, uh, the book on global responsibility to the former president of the German Bundesbank. Why? Well, because he was an honest banker, you know, of the old style. And he helped me greatly when I was in troubles. He, I did not know this person. He is a Protestant from Hamburg. Uh, he was a Protestant in Hamburg. And um, when I was uh, then uh, without any means uh, after this compromise we had, uh, when I lost my uh, ecclesiastical approval of my teaching uh, on 18th of December, uh, 79, uh, uh, and then we found a compromise in 80. Uh, this Dr. Karl Clausen uh, wrote me a letter he would like to visit me with his wife. And he, uh, he said, uh, uh, well, uh, well, with great pleasure. Uh, he had read the book, Does God Exist? And so he, we got to be friends. Uh, and he su uh, supported me to get funds and so on, what uh, I needed as you did for, for the Loose Foundation. Uh, and so you see, this kind of banker is different of what we got afterwards it, all over the world. Uh, um, even, I must say, like the Swiss uh, 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 Bank Corporation before, uh, now it's called, uh, uh, you know, you have it everywhere with this science here. We had a different kind of of, uh, of, uh, of, of character in the banks. So all this, and here I come to your point, I also agree, I think this phase of transition uh, is really a trace, probably, uh, or certainly a phase of transition, not only for the banking system, and not only for the United States, I think in the whole world, because the whole world is now really in troubles, everywhere. I think all the Chinese, will have to change a great deal of things. And I am sure that ethics have a greater chance uh, later on. Uh, unfortunately for me, it will be too late. You are still young people here, you know. Uh, but uh, uh, my time is limited. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and here, the younger generation uh, I, I may have some hope. I'm, uh, of course, I'm a realist. I see tremendous problems coming up. Uh, I think we are uh, not at the end of this session, we are just at the beginning. And you will feel, everybody will feel it, our foundations will feel it, our charities, our, um, um, uh, all, all the NGOs, uh, you know, the financial system in, uh, in your private life. And all this is not, uh, will change our attitude. I think uh, I was also encouraged to hear uh, yesterday that one of the persons present reflected a little on the fire uh, uh, here and said uh, uh, she, I heard, uh, was just near. Uh, her house was safe, but the other one burned down. And she said, I reflected uh, on the what happens to all the people uh, the U.S. Air Force bombarded when I saw this fire? Mm. What happens to all these people? Well, you see, that is, uh, and that's my last remark, what I, uh, uh, we can learn it by theory, but we must generally learn by experience. I talked to George Soros, which is one of the great financiers in the world, already some years ago. I said, well, uh, don't you think that 
uh, the system has to be changed. The finance system has to be changed. I was in the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland, and he said, yes, of course it should be changed. If a man as I am, he said, I'm able to, how do you say, to shatter or to uh, the British pound, to, you know, shatter, is this a good term? Yeah. Mm -hmm. sure. huh? mm -hmm. um, then something is wrong with the system. If one speculator can make this kind of thing, so we should change. I said, when will you, will you change? He said, well, we should change immediately. But generally the world learns only through suffering. And that is what happened now. I mean, we, we, we shall learn that. We are all sa shall learn that. I, uh, when you hear the people in New York, uh, you know, uh, I was only three days there, but I heard enough. Especially that they have no solution for the problems. That is perhaps the most impressive thing. As a matter of fact, nobody really knows how to go. If you see the discussions in, the, in Congress now about the automobile uh, industry and so on, very different views. As a matter of fact, everybody would like to, to pay, but where, is the, where does the money come from? And all this is not resolved. Uh, uh, and even the, your Treasury Secretary has, I heard him this, this morning, I'm a very, a very early bird uh, to see what is going on in the world. He, he explained to Congress that he changed the whole method, you know, the whole strategy. Well, how is it possible? Um, as a matter of fact, this shows, and I conclude with that, that religions are challenged to make a positive contribution. And what we, we heard from Clark is precisely that a lot of things are going on for both of you. Mm -hmm. And I think we agree on that. But it has to be enlightened. It has not to be fanatical. And uh, that is, of course, a problem of the Muslims. But I am also especially happy what you said about Muslim-Jewish co uh, co cooperation. The, I think uh, the United States have a great chance. Uh, it's easier than, I think, in Europe where you have big uh, Muslim man minorities and sometimes, well, we have also, I think, uh, but uh, the Jewish communities in, in, in Germany are mostly coming from the East uh, and are not uh, so established as here uh, Jewish communities are established. I was also invited, as a matter of fact, already many years ago to, to the Jewish organization in Los Angeles and was in Palm Springs and a whole week lecturing, I have best impressions. So I think that's a real chance that you show to uh, the people in Israel and in Palestine that it is possible to work together. Uh, I think that's not a new phenomenon. I think uh, um, also even in the time of early Judaism, in Hellenism, it was the Hellenistic Jews who were in the diaspora outside the Holy Land who practically promoted a new kind of Judaism. Uh, and we need, of course, a reform uh, of all the three religions. I spoke about this yesterday, but I think uh, it's a, a great chance. And we have to see this crisis. This crisis is, of course, uh, uh, has its negative sides, but it's a, a great chance at the same time. <laughs>